All right, and I think we're live. Um, hey guys, what's going on? Taxation is theft. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a late start today with some technical issues, but I would like to welcome Mike Shipley. Um, Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Um, pretty good. So uh, Mike is one of the founders of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. He's also um, involved in a few other caucuses. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'll mess it up. <laughs> Sure. So uh, I'm one of the founders of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. Um, I'm also the founder, one of the founders of the Libertarian Caucus, and I'm one of the founders of the Libertarian Party Audacious Caucus. Um, I'm also currently treasurer of Outright Libertarians, um, and there's a whole collection of other projects I could, you know, go on and name. Um, right now, one of the most exciting is the push for bottom unity, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Cool. Awesome. So um, before we get into that, because um, I know that we're, we're going to that'll take up all of our time. Um, and actually, I'm I'm going to try to I'm going to turn um, my feed off to you. So uh, so you're not going to see me um, and see if that helps some of these technical issues over here. Um, but uh, before we um, before we get into the bottom unity, um, let's talk about um, your involvement with the Sarwark campaign, because that's actually a pretty campaign that's going on there in Phoenix, right? Yes, yes, I'm really excited about it. So, what's um, w what does it look like out there? Is who's he running against? Um, are are you getting good responses from people? So, we've been walking neighborhoods every night for the past um, couple of weeks. The what's going on in Phoenix is that the former mayor has resigned so that he can run for Congress. Um, he's not allowed to continue holding the mayor, um, you know, position as like, once he, he's running. He can't, I don't know if it's a state law or what it is, but he has to, you know, give up the seat. So he mm -hmm. has done that, and we are now holding a special election. Um, he's being, <sighs> Nick Sarwark is being challenged by um, Kate Gallego, who is um, an establishment Democrat. She's been in the state legislature for a long time. Wait, I think she might actually have been a city council person for a long time. Um, to be honest, I don't keep track of all the status and all yeah. their different things because they're, <laughs> you know. Why do that? Right. Like they, I don't know. They're just like, she's, she's one of them, right? And um, the other guy's name is Danny Valenzuela. Um, he's definitely an establishment Democrat as well. Um, I imagine, I know he's got a political background as well, you know another one of them. So um, Nick is, um, we've been getting a really good reception. A lot of people are pretty much fed up with the status quo from top to bottom, you know? So um, when, when I knock on the door, typically they find out it is a bipartisan race. A lot of people do want to know um, what party he's registered in. And when I tell them, a lot of times they get really excited to sign because they, <laughs> they, you know, they're excited to sign for something outside of what they've been getting. Right. Well, that's awesome. Um, cause I know it's, yeah, it's, there's, there's, um, always mixed feelings with that. Some people are excited to get someone that's not, um, in the two parties. And then some people are just, they, they get, they get weird about like, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> um, it's, uh, so, so that's good to hear. You're mostly getting uh, positive, um, feedback on that. Um, so cool. So so let's talk about um, bottom unity. Um, I know. You, did, did you watch the interview I had with um, with Dane uh, maybe a week ago? I did. I caught the first half, and then I missed some, and then I caught the end of it. So okay. So um, I caught most of it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So we were talking a lot about this, and um, you know, obviously, there's there's a lot of questions, um, and there's so I I. I'm more, you know, most of the people I associate with are more of the, the ANCAP side. So I guess the, the lower, what would that be? The, the bottom right? Um, bottom right, yes. And so, and so one of the things that they're concerned about, and I, you know, I tried to push Dane on this, and, and I think he gave me, you know, really good responses. Like, um, you know, he didn't make me feel like he's going to come from my property. Um, you know, all these other things. He sounded like more or less he's, his, his ideal lifestyle is perfectly compatible with that of the bottom right. Um, but in, in talking to some other people um, in, in the, um, I guess the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, it sounds like they're, 
they're more um, they they're not out to steal, but the way that they view property rights is the things that they want to do is not considered stealing to them, but to uh, to a bottom right might be considered. And we'll we'll get into that into a minute. But one of the things that that you mentioned to me is not so much you know bringing up this fight in between us, but that you know we're trying to we're we're not trying to fight what our differences are, but we're actually just trying to unify because there are so some so many similarities that we we can help each other out in you know in you know basically getting rid of big government because that's um that's kind of the big thing that's that's in both of our ways so right what's what's your take on that um okay so i do think there's a lot of common ground um everyone wants to end the drug war everyone wants to um end u.s imperialism and you know stop murdering people all over the globe, everyone wants to scale back, if not abolish the prison state, the police state. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot to work with just with that. Um, Absolutely. I would kind of um, dig a little deeper into the idea that if somebody identifies as an anarchist, then by definition, they want to abolish all of the same controls over property that left libertarians are saying we want to abolish. So um, for a left libertarian in, um, in our semantics, the phrase private property isn't referring to principles of ownership or possession. It's referring to the legal constructs, for instance, the title, the, uh, you know, the, the land authority, the idea that you have to get permission from the county assessor to decide where the board of your land is. Um, all of those things, the statist controls over what counts as property and whose property gets protected is the thing that's in question. And I think that we actually, we don't have to, it's not even forced. Like we are in 100% agreement with anarcho-capitalists on the fact that that needs to be abolished. So um, I, I guess the way I've always kind of seen, you know, like a, a county assessor is something that could be replaced with with maybe a private um, a private organization. But but basically, you know, you've got different people on different plots of land. And, um, you know, if there's ever, you know, if there's ever a dispute, then you have, you know, you have some place that you can go to and say, OK, I want this piece of land to be mine and I want to build a home on it. Um, so I'm going to go to this, you know, a public registry and it can be, it can be whatever. It doesn't have to be government, but I'm just going to write down that, that this is my land. And in that way, if there's anybody else who, um, who thinks like, you know, maybe that's their land and they were away the, the day that I found it, um, then, then, you know, we could see immediately that, oh, somebody else already claims that that land is theirs or, you know, we, we can at least bring up that discussion and, you know, whether or not the, um, the state's laws are in place are, are valid to, to settle that dispute is another question, but at least there would be some sort of, you know, oh, well, we can figure out if there is some other person, you know, kind of, um, I guess kind of the way it works with, uh, uh, internet domain names, but maybe that's a bad example. Cause that's, there's, there's a central authority on that, that you have to, you know, purchase the original from. But, um, I, I guess where I'm going with that is, is I, I kind of see some, some validity in, in some type of system with that um what would be what would be the bottom left's um solution to that so so i guess my solution would be you know get the government out of it and replace it with with you know some sort of public registry that anyone can go to or anyone can create their own registry to compete with kind of kind of like how maybe a credit bureau is a good um uh, a good you know a private um analogy to that type of thing so what I hear you saying is that the statist form of that registry and its controls is unjust. Am I hearing you correctly? It's a source of injustice that is distorting property relations between people. Um, yeah, I would say so to some degree. It's probably less than, than most of their other organizations, but yeah. So it needs to go away because all of the things associated with it are bad. And what needs to replace it needs to look very different in order for the replacement to actually fulfill the promise of a world set free that is no longer 
under the the things we associate with statism in today's market. Is that right? Uh, well, are we talking about the the just the sure. well, sure, because all you did to what I heard is um, that you suggested replacing the justice monopoly with independent justice processes that aren't linked to um, state power. Oh, well, I, right? I guess I wasn't talking about the, the justice in that part. I, I'm really ta just talking about like having a registry, having having a place where, you know, well, but you can no, go because you said you said dis dispute resolution that's right. what that is that's justice right that's kind of the other the other side of that so yeah you know so let's say let's say all the you know the the government's courts go away and, and we have some other way to resolve that right to re so, resolve any disputes so what we would have what we get to do together as anarchists is teach a bunch of people that they don't need to rely on the state and then allow them to decide together what they want to replace it with, right? And we all know that humans like to dispute things and that the uh, demand for a dispute resolution process of some type will not go away, right? right. So what we can, we can say is that processes can, can replace it that can look more like justice, less like statism and its abuses, and that that would be a good thing, right? And right. you're asking me what they look like. Um, I'm, I'm partly kind of trying to craft for you a space where um, what I think that should look like does not become prescriptive, right? Because we want to avoid the temptation of central planning. I can't central plan anarchism for you, and you can't plan it for me. And if either of us tries to say that we can, then I would be skeptical of that person's commitment to an actual world set free. So the first thing to say is that I'm not going to tell you what I think it should look like so much as I'm telling you what I believe it can look like. And um, if we educate people about the different ways that it's possible to think about property in a world set free, absent the land monopoly, then we give them the tools to have a collaborative discussion and decide what those justice systems might look like. Okay, so so I guess that's that's a fair way to put it. Um, I I think you know there's there's kind of I guess in what you say there's there's almost a sense of democracy forming there where where you say like we as individuals would have to decide a system and ultimately it's you know that that leads to like what we have now where mm. different people want different things and and of course the majority is going to try and use their weight which I, I think is something that neither one of us want because I, I think we both agree that you know majority ruling over a minority is still tyranny okay so there's some nuance there I would not say democracy um, because that implies a system um, a closed system where majority can dominate the minority I would say animated by a democratic spirit and by that I mean that the people who choose to associate for a particular purpose then are able to utilize consensus process among themselves. Um, but the freedom from tyranny is contained in the freedom of association that nobody is ever compelled to associate with a particular set of people that are you know, making a particular democratic decision. So let's say, for example, um, like a, a great example is an HOA, a homeowners association. Those are right. um, incredible well known to be incredibly abusive and um, usually usually not maybe physically but like to like the harassment point of like literally measuring your grass and like charging right. you money and threatening to evict right um, those don't work they they um, they purport to be democratic in spirit there's a homeowners association you can go to the meeting you can sit on the board if you really want to suffer um, but you can't actually like withdraw from the HOA because it, you're locked into it um, to like to that tyranny that you say of the majority, right? So right. freedom of association and um, consensus process have to go together because without the freedom to exit um, a tyrannizing uh, majority decision, um, you don't actually have the consent, uh, like the, the, the fundamental concept of consent is like primary. Right. Libertarianism is consent culture. It's right. centering the, the autonomy and the self-determination of the individual. 
and without that, you don't, you can't, you can't. I don't know. Anyway, though, so that's the nuance behind de democracy as a system, bad. Democratic as a way of making decisions, not so bad. So I guess uh, l let's go back to a concrete example because I think that's, you know, that's kind of where the rubber hits the road and where, where we can see. Um, you know what what as you say what it could look like so you know let's say for example um if we're talking about like a place where where, re where property would be registered um and and you know measured and registered and said and you know or sorry let, let's let's not talk about a registry let's talk about you know one person says this is my land from from this tree to this tree um i'm gonna build a home on it i'm, I'm gonna do whatever i want um and at that point, he, he leaves so that he can go get supplies so he can come back and build his home. Now, while he's gone, somebody else comes along and says, hey, this is a nice piece of property. I'm going to claim this as my land, and I'm going to start building on it. And let's say he doesn't go to get supplies. He has already got supplies with him, so he just starts cutting down trees and building. Um, at, at what point, um, it, you know, so the, the first guy comes back and says, wait, this is my land. You can't build on it. I already claimed it as mine how is that type of dispute settled or how could the first person reserve that land in, in, you know, in what you think things would look like? Okay. So something that we need to unpack an assumption built into um, your question is this idea that land is so scarce that we actually need to be fighting over it, right? That we actually need to be trying to claim one another's living space because there isn't enough of it to actually go around. And the reason it appears to be that way, and we're fighting over resources in cities like rats, um, is because of the statist processes that substitute magic pieces of paper called land titles for the principle of just acquisition. So if this is the quantity of land, oh wait, that's, I don't wanna show that on the screen. Okay, this square is the quantity of land in the world. This is the entire land surface of the earth. Okay. Okay. I need a tiny little piece of, I'm gonna cut off a tiny little square, like a tiny little. This is the amount of land that's represented by land titles that the state has you fighting over. See the difference? Yep. So the, the idea that somebody in this tiny little square is gonna fight you for your house is gonna try running into your house and try to steal it from you because you went to the store is completely absurd and completely boxed in by the idea that this is all we have to work with when we really have this. Well, I, I think in, so in general, you're right. But, you know, let's say for example, there's, um, uh, you know, it, in order to make your life easier, you can you need water to survive. You can either collect rainwater, which which you're going to be dependent on rain, or you can pick land that's that's next to a stream where you can collect water from the stream. Um, now the, the now you can go anywhere in in that big sheet of paper. You can go anywhere on that land and collect rainwater, but. Um, if, if you want, you know, the, there will be more people who say, I'd rather live right next to the stream and the amount of land that's next to a stream or a river is, is there's much less of it. Um, and you know, you look at, you look at anything like whether there's, whether there are natural resources, like people move to, to cities, um, usually looking for work or, or, you know, things like that. And these cities start popping up where there are resources. People kind of, they flood to these places where the resources are because that's where they want to be. That's like, nobody wants to live in the middle of the desert, or I don't want to say nobody, but most people don't want to live in the middle of the desert in, in the Texas I, heat. Um, I live in the middle of the desert. Yeah, but that's, and, and that's you, and that's fine. So but let me, I just want to, I need to stop you there. Okay. The idea that humans are collecting themselves in tiny little dense inner cities because they want to be packed together and stacked on top of one another is proven false by the existence of the city of Phoenix. And I'll explain. So while an eastern city is often confined to a river valley, right, or a port area, right, um, and they didn't, of course, they grew up at a time when pedestrian traffic was more the norm, right, so they're, they're densely populated. But in the west, where we were settled in a time when cars existed, for one, and the desert is a flat expanse of land, when people are free to build out, um, move separate from one another and create plots of land that are large. Of course, I'm 
we weren't a hundred percent free. Like that, you know, that Maricopa County divided right. those up like hundreds of years ago and decided how many plots there would be and how big they would be and all that. Right. So just like, and of course it's colonized land. So it was never theirs to grant titles in the first place, but I digress. Let's just, I, I'm coming back to the idea that, um, People do not choose to be cramped when they don't have to be. They do prefer to have a little bit of space in between them. And um, I mean, right, I, I don't have, know if you've ever seen Phoenix, but but there's but there's always a reason. So like, so I grew up in in Los Angeles, and there are a ton of people who move there, and now it's no longer for a, a natural resource; it's for a man-made resource of. Um, the entertainment industry and people move there from all over the country and they cram themselves into small apart, small expensive apartments um, to, you know, to try and be a part of the dream and make themselves a name in Hollywood. Um, and, and a lot of people do this and it's, it's kind of, you know, it, they're not thinking about, um, you know, they're not thinking about like what you said, like, Hey, I'd rather live in a place where I could be free and expand. They want to be a part of something. Oh, don't worry. My, my dogs will do that eventually too. Nobles always likes to make a cameo, so here's your cameo. <laughs> Hi. All right. Okay, I'm sorry. Go on. So, so people make that choice, and and you know, I agree. In in some places where you know, like let's say you grow up in a city, and and you know, your parents have always taught you, like, oh yeah, you you buy land in these little quadrants, and and that's just the way life is. There are those people. I agree with you that they don't even have this concept of of land outside of the city, but there are so many people that like. They come from small towns. Um, I met a guy from Worms, Nebraska, who moved to Los Angeles to be like Worms, Nebraska was a population of 16 and probably 10, uh, miles, uh, a little a little town, plenty of land. And he moved all the way to to Los Angeles to to get into showbiz into this cramped little city. Um, so people do that all the time. But the, the reality is like you can move like maybe five hours outside of Los Angeles and, and still have access to land. But if you're, if the, if the business, the lifestyle that you want to be involved in is in that city, there's not free land inside of Los Angeles that you can move into and start claiming and developing or, or you know, like that. It's, it's basically so, already taken. To me, to me, it sounds like you're, you're still arguing from scarcity and um, completely failing, or I should say neglecting to, um, I don't want to put negative words on you. Just, I just, let's realize that um, an open voluntary marketplace is exist that none of us can predict. So just because in modern, under modern state capitalism, we have these dense cities where scarcity is considered a norm and where people have to live on top of each other so they can fight for jobs on, underneath corporations, which is another form of scarcity. Um, I don't see why we have to um, look to that paradigm for an example of the way property relations would look in a world set free. Right? So, um, and I guess I come back to the sprawl of Phoenix in a certain in a certain sense for another example, every time, you know, you know develop like a, I can't think of the word, there's like a word for it. Like every time neighborhood they, developments? Every time another neighborhood happens, they just build another, you know, and I'm at this point, it's so formulaic. They need a grocery store, they need a convenience store, they need, you know, a hardware store. And it's the same, and I'm not saying I want to carve out the world of corporate America, of course not. But what I'm saying is that when people choose to be in a place, then the services they need arise from their presence. So it's not gonna be any different if you could choose from all of the land base that's available versus just the dense inner cities. However, I guess I didn't mean to derail that. I just wanted to and then come back to your original question about the justice services and the idea of a registry and who decides how long your property can be abandoned before um, it can be used and occupied by another inhabitant. Was I think that was your original question. Yeah. Okay, so, um, the short, shortest answer is that going back to the democratic um, principles, and these are we could think you, the, so it, right libertarians. You make of a word like market forces, like the invisible hand, right? And left libertarians are going to freak out that I even went there, but whatever, <laughs> just roll roll with it, right? Um, we don't know what those processes are going to look like until we're free of the statist monopoly that currently controls what our laws look like and, and what form our justice has to take. We won't know until we laborious process of educating ordinary people about what a world set free can look like and principles that are involved in thinking about one, right? 
what it means to take responsibility for your own agency, your own autonomy, your self-determination, and everything that comes with that, right? What is the link between my property and my labor? Why is that considered a right? Why is it so important for me to be vigilant about that right? Right? So now let's say abolition happens. I don't know exactly what the what justice service people are going to choose, but I'm betting that once they have become educated about libertarian ideas, they're not going to choose to subscribe to a land registry service that um, drags away homeless people if, merely for laying there, right? I'm not going to subscribe to um, a police state service that I know is is disproportionately harming black and brown people, right? I'm not going to subscribe to, to white supremacy police state, right? Like, I just don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I can tell you that we already have anarchy in most of our types of property. So if your property is not currently represented by a magic piece of paper, it is not protected by the state if it's under a certain value. And the default, what you do in the absence of security and justice anomaly is a lot more like use and occupancy. So think about the way you treat, let's say your laptop at a coffee shop. You know, depending on how wealthy you are, they might protect your, your laptop, right? But mine's not protected. I have insurance for mine, right? But that doesn't mean I just leave it sitting around because depending on how long I walk away, right? Let's say I go to smoke a cigarette and someone, I don't smoke cigarettes, but just roll with it. Um, you know, and, and I'm standing outside for five minutes. I think I'm going to be out there. And then someone walks by and that I know, and we start talking for 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh, my God, I left my laptop inside. And somebody thought it was gone and used and occupied it, right? That happens. So guess what? I don't leave my laptop sitting for 20 minutes at coffee shop. I don't do that. I protect it myself because I understand that um, the norms are that when property is abandoned, the longer it has been abandoned, the more likely it is for someone else to say, hmm, it doesn't look like anyone's using that. Now, I'm not saying it's okay to take my laptop. Of course not. And in most cases, someone returning to the lost and found before they just like took it. Anarchy in property. And that anarchy does not look like magic pieces of paper and artificial lines around every little thing on the planet. Okay, that's. I, I think that's pretty fair um, in that example. Um, I, I just want to say real quick, it looks like um, Facebook is... Uh, I, I guess people are just getting audio and no video. So if you're... Uh, I'm going to be uploading this... Um, so it, it will be available afterwards. Uh, it's, I'm recording it here locally, so um, it'll be the upload video. But uh, I guess folks just having some issues today. Um, uh, there's actually a question here. Um, I was never really connected that back to land. I don't know if you want to hear me ramble um, for a minute or so. I, I do, but I, I think, well, I, I get in my head, uh, we, we talk about that, because like in my head, I, I kind of already got what you were saying, that, um, and you know, maybe you'll say it and you'll say it wrong. But, um, All right. But so like, let's say, for example, if I if I build a house and I leave it, um, someone's going to see the house and, and they're going to say, oh, well, that's a house. It looks well taken care of. It's probably not abandoned. Um, and, you know, I was going to say, well, you know, if you leave your house for five minutes, obviously you can't pick it up and take it with you. Um, but if you leave it there and, you know, but then if it looks like the walls are falling off of it, the, the roof is gone, um, the grass hasn't been mowed in 10 years, then someone might say, oh, this must be abandoned. And then they would they would go and just squat on it and, you know, See if anyone comes by, maybe, and and if no one comes by for a few months, then just say I'm going to take it over and and make it mine. Um, and, and I think even the in the bottom right, um, I, I think that would kind of be acceptable because I mean you have to look at like, you might have like a totally abandoned ghost town where you know it's obvious he's living there, and you know it, I don't think there's an ex expectation that if you take that property, someone's going to come back and say, oh well, I know I don't I haven't lived here in forever, but uh, this property was inherited to me by my great grandfather and it's mine, so you have to give me rent or something. I think that would be pretty ridiculous. Um, well, I would, I would think that like, if that did happen at the very least, the, the people in that geographic pr proximity would have already a set of established, um, conflict resolution processes, um, that they trust and that they can turn to. Right. So whether that looks like my subscription to the, um, you know, my, my insurance that pays for a hotel, so I find a new place. I mean, like, I don't know, I don't know what the Uber for landmarks looks like. Right. Okay. And, that, exist. and that's interesting that, that you, I mean, you call it the, the Uber of land norms. That's actually an interesting um, point because there might be, you know, some service that pops up that says, you know, it, it maybe it would be some sort of like map to, to abandoned properties where you abandon your property and you just say, here it is, go, you know, a anyone who wants it can go take it. Um, and totally. And totally. in exchange for doing that, the benefit to the person abandoning the property is that they can, there's other properties that they can go take. Um, totally. That is a so great example. The, the, so, yeah. So I, I guess that's an interesting. Like, a, like an Airbnb timeshare. Oh, that's a really cool idea. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> should like build that. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely cool, but um, it's, it's, um, 
Yeah, I guess one of the things one of the things that would be is you would have to assume that I, I sorry you wouldn't have to assume, but I would assume that in some system like that the properties would probably be pretty run down because you you wouldn't like let's say I had a property and it was let's say it was a really nice house and I was going to abandon it and put it into this app for somebody else. Um, at what's what well, building this? No, that is disproven by the way the rating system on eBay and Amazon and Yelp. The ra you know the the reputation the rating system. If you're not first of all, when you're living in a place, typically you want that place to be habitable and you want it to be right. like it's your home, right? So, I mean, granted, we get comfortable in our homes and we we deal with clutter that we don't want our guests to see because you know whatever we lower our standards a little bit, right? But we don't. I mean, okay, some people do. Um, but I, I guess, okay, so we can have examples. Let's look at Silence of the Lambs. The way he did his home, it's full of freaking moths, right? Mm -hmm. Private property didn't stop him from doing that, right? Because there are some people that don't care for things, and there are some people that well, do. I, I guess what and I'm getting at is if I have a really nice house, I've been keeping really good care of it, and I want to abandon it, why would I abandon it as opposed to selling it um, if, if, you know, the chances of other people abandoning their properties might, might not look so nice. And, you know, you bring up the race system and that could be a thing where, okay, maybe, maybe you can only claim this abandoned property if you're a member of the system and you have some, some ratings or something, but then it becomes a closed system, which, which, which creates a system of scarcity. I mean, I think me having, I don't want to put a prescriptive answer on that. I feel like um, but what resonates more with me are use and occupancy norms because they feel to me the most natural to the way that I have always guarded my own property and treated property that I, um, you know, like we find something that's just out of nowhere and there's no way to, that, that's an abandoned thing. And, you know, it's the, you default to the sort of finders keepers thing, right? Conversely, if I, I guess, find it in a coffee shop, right, then right. maybe I'm going to give it to the, them so they can place it in their in their lost and found, right? So, so but, let's let's run with that for a little bit because okay, so you know, let's say somebody occupies the house and you leave for for a couple of weeks, then okay, it's it's fine. Like y you can trust that okay, no one, no reasonable person's gonna say, well, I've seen this house empty for two weeks, even though it looks uh, well kept. Uh, I'm not going to assume it's abandoned, but what if it's something that's like. Uh, a summer home where where you go to it you know maybe once to assume that it's abandoned what's um you know what's well, to stop someone from from trying to squat on it i think that one answer to that is that the time that's not being utilized um it could be utilized in the uberized manner that we just discussed so let's say that you're only there during the summer and it's a college town well a student can live there during the winter right and we can use technology to to figure that out much more easily. Another idea that I have is that if the people in this given vicinity, right, presumably there's this market for dispute resolution and and the registry. So you know, you report. Well, I mean, like I don't even leave my apartment for a weekend without making sure that I have someone checking in, you know, and just kind of keeping an eye. Um, People, when you leave property, you intend to come back to it. Like, we tend to take responsibility for that, right? So if you're leaving it, I presume, I've never had a summer house that I only go to once a year, but I presume that maybe you've got, you know, a cleaning service that goes in quarterly and just make sure that the dust is cleared. So it's, and I don't know, right? But I feel like, um, what was the original question? What so, was the question? Well, I, I guess, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even really sure. I guess I, kind of what I'm trying to see is, um, because from the from the from the bottom let's say there's kind of the fear that um, that what the bottom left would do is just say like I'm gonna assume that since there's nobody in this house that you know for, nobody's been in this house all winter um, I'm gonna occupy it and if anybody ever, um, uh, you know comes to say hey this is my house you shouldn't be in here um, then they're gonna have a problem kicking them out or even the fact that because it's not like you know if it's done with an Airbnb service right you're you're thinking you can look at the reviews you literally you know that the people going in there might might have good reviews but even with that um I know some people who, who rent with Airbnb I hear stories about like people leave and they take TV or they take the silverware and there's nothing they can do about it Airbnb doesn't help them recover anything there's no deposits um okay but magic uses of state paper are already not protecting you from that and I have it for you if anybody told you anarchism was a utopia they lied Anarchy can't stop that any more than magic pieces of state paper. Right, I'm not arguing that it should. I guess I guess what I'm what I'm more interested in is what um you know what type of people are the bottom left 
are are is, are they going to be a problem where we have where you know this is going to be a problem well, where they're no, going to start taking property like that? So at the bottom left, the entire motivation behind wanting to live in a world where artificial where scarcity is not artificially enforced is so that we no longer are forced to compete over scarce resources for the benefit of you politically connected, um, you know, of the ruling class. Right? The idea is not so that we can oh, get rid of the ruling class and keep fighting over the scraps. That is just absurd. You know, flourish instead of merely survive. That is the promise of a world set free. It's not a world where prosperity is restricted even further, or where we continue to live within the boundaries of constricted prosperity. Oh, like poof, magic, the ruling class went away, but we just keep fighting over, you know, their little mad piece of paper. No, no. We're going to expand out into a beautiful vista that is memory and actually live. That's what's going to happen. Okay, interesting. And, and yeah, I, I think um, to kind of go back to what you said a minute ago, like there's the, the, the fact that the bottom left is interested in getting rid of government and the bottom right is also, um, it, I, I kind of look at it like this, like, um, because I know some of, some of my followers that mostly stick to the right, are, they, they've even accused me of going left now um, you know, for even having a civil conversation with, with people from the left. But it's, what's, what's interesting is that if, if both of us get what we want and the government goes away, it's, so, so let's say, let's say me and, and my ANCAP friends, we all get rid of government, we succeed. Um, the, the bottom left is still there, and the things that you're, the, the, the ways that you're envisioning the future, um, you're envisioning it without government. So the reality is, whether we partner with you or not, government's going away, and whether we partner with you or not, when government goes away, we're still all living in the same world together, and we're going to have to deal with our differences on some level. So it's, it's I think that's a really interesting point, because it's not like, um, you know, I, I guess that most of the people on the right, bottom or top right, are you know they're afraid of, of socialism as they're going to steal your money to pay for healthcare programs, and that's not really what um, the libertarian socialist is about. Uh, no, correct that's, all, that's what socialism. Right. So, so that's that's really not an issue. We're, we're talking about stealing to pay for. We're talking about we're talking about living, um, living. You know, I, I guess as you said, not fighting over the scraps that are left over from from the system that only only give us access to the scraps. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I, I think that's. Um, I mean, I, I think that's pretty fair. And I think you know, for the for the most part, um, you know, in, in talking to you and and Dane and some of the other lib socks, it's you know, I, I don't have this feeling like you know, like my style, my lifestyle is going to be at risk. Like you know, government's going to go away, and then you guys are going to turn to pirates and go around robbing everybody. Um, that's you know, I think that's you know, it's interesting. It's like I, it's the boogeyman theory. Like everybody, you know, whether, whether it's they want to control someone and, and you know create uh, a fight between them, they make they make the other person look like the boogeyman. Or or to some people, it's um, you know, from people they don't understand, they kind of turn into the boogeyman themselves. Um, but I think what's really important is to understand is that a statist, whether whether from the left or the right, a statist wants to use force to force you to live the way he wants to live. But an anarchist, whether from the left or the right, does not want you to be forced to live the way that they want to live at all. Right, right. And I think that it's really, if I could just get one thing across about the radical left, is that it's just like another radical narrative that we would be familiar with, one that's very staunchly anti-statist, and one that's very vigilant toward authoritarian narratives, right? We already know what it's like in the LP when statist politicians get a pander and they try to steal back the votes that they think they're entitled to, and they try to lean and make themselves look libertarian, but they aren't really. They know what it needs to push back, much to be on guard for that, and to make sure that the clarity of our vision is maintained, right? And the same is true of a radical anarchist. The different semantics, right? And um, there's different sort of lenses through which um, the, the vision is expressed, right? But ultimately, a world set free is a world free of coercive institutions. And what's like, and what's happening across the bottom is um, everybody's just trying to paint picture of what that looks like to them, right? And we get really excited about it. And then, you know, when people are excited, they start talking past each other, right? And it starts to look like conflict. And of course, all of this is happening in polarized dialogue, right? So like that, that talk also has a study that, that everyone on the bottom is, is trying to push back so that we can, you know, maintain the integrity of our vision. And I'm sorry, what I was, oh, one thing I want to cross is that um, those are not so disparate that um, okay, you know, the essence of a institution is what it is, right? And so that is something that, you know, I feel like it'd be very fine, right? But we have to want, we have to want unity one another and freedom from all the of institutions more than like fighting with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, the government thrives on us fighting with each other. Um, <laughs> I think in every aspect. Um, I, I'm wondering, have you, uh, I know you have the, the, it's like 10 question choice pull quiz, um, where I think, I think libertarian is at the top, um, authoritarian is at the bottom. And then I remember what the side, I think the sides are, are just, I think they just left to right. Where, where are you all on that? So I'm at the tip of that, right? So anarchism is anarchism. So you're 100% free and economically. Um, 
I like that chart for outreach to status. And the reason why I like that chart for outreach to status is for one, it's very simple, it's very easy, it's ideal for an outreach table. Um, it asks questions through the lens of mainstream politics, which is um, personal freedom and economic freedom. Right. right? So that's, that's great, it's, it's ideal for this. Um, but it's not so ideal for is the nuance behind economic freedom, right? It's possible to envision, um, and it's possible to envision, um, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about the way it's could be structured, right? Whether it's worker ownership or whether it's boss, you know, employee hierarchical, right? Um, there's different ways to think about land, whether it's used in office or whether it's, um, you know, whether it's based on the idea of commons, right? Or whether a person, I mean, there's different ideas, right? And so that is what square chart gives us, right? So instead of having economic, I'll switch to a little tip tip so that like me and an end cap look identical. So I do, that's an argument in favor of that we're more identical than we think, right? right. But um, on the square, right, we have, so instead of being squished into that tip tip, where now we have a, a scale that represents those different ideas. So what you try to tell people is that tip tip square is the bottom hole zero line, right? So if you're 100% free, you will be anywhere along that bottom edge, right? That's the zero tip tip. Okay. And then, you know, there's degrees of statism and get a little bit more, and, you know, it's this, yeah. this scale on that chart is low. So, and, and I think that's, that's actually a really important point. So, so on, on, that, you know, on that flat line um, of freedom, we may fall on opposite ends of it, but at the end of the day, like right now, our main issue is that there's this big government beast that we're fighting. I mean, that's why, that's why anyone's involved in the Libertarian Party. That's kind of the purpose of the party is to, is to shrink the size of government and, and for some to completely get rid of it. Um, and so because we're, we're, that's the game that we're fighting. And so that chart, you know, like you said, is statist oriented. In that game of fighting the government, we're all on the same team. Um, so I think that really, that, that's, you know, they're really important unit for bottom unity. Um, and, you know, once it's done, and, and, you know, here's the other thing, like, you know, this, this spectrum of, it, it, when, I, when I talked to Dean, like, most of the things he said were that, you know, the way he wanted to live his life was he wanted to spend his energy, his own personal energy, to voluntarily take care of other people and help people in need. Um, and that's commendable. And I didn't feel like he was going to be taking any from me in order to do that. So really what it, what it sounds like is, you know, everybody's got different interests. Some people, like, some people want to, they want to be doctors so they can help people. Some people want to be athletes because they just like the game. Some people want to be um, philosophers. Like, whatever your life choice is of, of what you want to do with, with your existence, nobody wants to spend it with people. Um, wh whatever you want to do with your life is going to be different for everybody. And I think as long as that doesn't interfere with other people, that's fine. And for some people, they want to, they want to create, produce, and make big things. And, and maybe you want to participate in some sort of tracking system of, you know, like money to keep track of how much you produce to exchange with others. Um, and if you want to, that's your right to do that. And at the same time, if you don't want to participate in that at all, and you want to participate in, in taking care of people and, and um, social issues, um, you know, it's, it's really just your own, uh, it's your personal preference of what you want to do with your life, but at the same time, like together we can at least say, but nobody should be telling us which of those we should be doing. Right, and um, you know, I might even add that I think there are ways that um, the different anarchist sort of rhetorical frames can benefit one another. Right. So if I'm a right libertarian and trying to tell people that private charity can be our safety net, um, the modern non-profit industrial complex is a form of artificially uh, and imposed scarcity, right? It's basically capitalism in the nonprofit sector, and it, it um, prohibits a, a wide variety of uh, mutual aid activities, um, and it also creates top to structures where resources are. But anyway, I'm, I'm off my point. Um, the mutual aid theme of talking about a voluntary safety net is a really powerful one, and I think that it can help shift that dialogue and, and give people a sense that um, mutual aid networks can actually be resilient enough to meet um, people's needs that aren't met through any other type of academic activity. And I'm trying to think of a parallel example from the the other direction, and, and what's coming most of mind is the way that, um, you know, so with sex work, sometimes when it's too social justice oriented, it can be off into where it, there's a vulner vulnerability where like, oh, women are just being exploited or you know, trans women are being exploited. And, and when you're able to set that back with a stronger uh, economic lens, where we are able to say, no, sex work is work, and this is a means of production that is unto my own self ownership. Um, then I can benefit from you know the economic language of the right, right? So I think that being able to navigate conversations with a broader range of vocabulary actually strengthens us. And I, I'm really excited to see what it looks like. Interesting. But yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um, and there's, there's something there's something else I want to point out. And I know we're not enemies by by any any degree of the word. Um, but I know you know some people are they're 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 afraid they've got bullyman syndrome. Um, but I just want to say, like, even if you're afraid that, you know, the bottom left or the bottom right is your enemy, just just think about this for a minute. Right now, your real enemy is the government. The government is the one that steals from you every day. Every day. The, the, the government is the one pointing a gun at you every day. Um, and at the very least, they, they get through that first. 
and then we can kind of work out our differences afterwards if, if there are any to work out because i mean honestly you know like i said I, I don't consider you an enemy um and as as much as i'm trying to dig at it and get you to say something that you know that's gonna be like you're gonna steal my property or it's like it's it's not there um and so i, I really don't think anyone would be afraid of that i, I think that's um I, I think that's you know the boogeyman um anyway is there um is there anything uh, before we go that you want to mention? Any websites, um, any causes uh, you're working with? The, the maybe the Libertarian Socialist website, uh, Facebook page, anything? Well, I do want to ask you to follow my, my personal advocacy page, which is my Shipley, comma Libertarian. So just look that up. Um, sometimes when I so the thing with caucus organizing is that we become um, perceived as a base for that caucus, and then that can make it difficult to push boundaries in other ways. So sometimes I use my personal page for that. So um, see like my most authentic individual opinion on that page. Um, and as far as the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, um, just facebook.com slash libsoc. I say libsoc, but just for clarity, libsoc, L-B-S-O-C, caucus, C-A-U-C-U-S. Um, the Audacious Caucus is on Facebook as well. So is the Povertarian Caucus. So is that right, Libertarians? I mean, you just search for the names and you find them. Most of them also have groups. Actually, they all have groups. So the page is where we put out information to the followers. That's when you click like, and then there's also a group, which is where we can collaborate with one another. So if you want to be active involved, join the group as well. If you just want to follow along and maybe interact with the content in the comments, um, go ahead and like and follow the pages. Um, and all of those projects have Twitters as well. Um, I probably, you know what I will do is I will put together a post with all of the different links in it, and I'll post that to my page in about 20 minutes. Cool. And actually, if you want to see that, I'll, I'll post it back to the video. So. Cool. Um, and um, something else you just said that's actually really interesting um, that I, I want to I want to all on for a minute. Um, it is you said that you know most of the things that you say when you when you push the boundaries you say them from your personal page rather than from the the um i guess the the caucus page and i think that's a really interesting point because like i uh, i struggle with this all the time because i'm i'm running a campaign um and i'm involved with the libertarian party and so everybody always comes to me like i got accused of being a racist today who hates minorities and the poor because that was this person's presumption of what a libertarian was because they probably heard you know one libertarian say something like that and we need to get out of this like um this groupthink mentality of you know there there are democrats who are who are good people and who wouldn't support any of the crap that's on the democrat platform um same with republicans just because somebody's in a group um does you know if they say something really good or really bad it does not necessarily speak directly for that group like a group itself has no mind it's a collection of a thousand people with different minds and if if they're not all the same people that never happens like it's i i've never been in a room with more than five people that i've ever been in a room with more than two people that all the same uh so uh so that's just the thought there with that but mike it's been great talking with you um i think we we got through a lot of interesting points um and hopefully um hopefully change some people's minds about how they see um the other side of the bottom and um and it's been great and and we'll talk again soon awesome thank you for having me on. i enjoyed it as well all right and taxation is theft taxation is certainly theft <laughs>